What is it about an Indiana Jones punch that is so damn satisfying? Because a normal punch sounds like this. But you put on an Indiana Jones type hat, and all of a sudden your punches sound like this. the desert. I miss the sea. And I miss waking up every morning, wondering what wonderful adventure the new day will bring to us. Those days have come and gone. Perhaps, perhaps not. How's it going guys? Welcome back to my channel and time for another episode of Luke's Reviews. On today's video, Harrison Ford dons the hat and whip for potentially the last time in what might be the final bow of one of the greatest characters in cinema history, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. The film opens with a blistering action sequence aboard a train, where Indiana, accompanied by a bumbling Toby Jones, seeks to take back a mysterious artifact from a Nazi pillage. Many years later, this same artifact comes hurtling back into Indy's life just as he's settling down for retirement. But with his plucky goddaughter in tow, one final adventure for Indiana Jones begins, full of daring chases, tomb raiding, and plenty of punching Nazis in the face. For context here, I view the original Indiana Jones trilogy, that's Raiders of the Lost Ark, Temple of Doom, and Last Crusade, as one of the greatest cinematic trilogies ever made. It is effortlessly enjoyable and a, a peak of adventure filmmaking. I don't mind Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. It has its flaws, but I would say I actually probably like it more than most. So with that being said, my expectations for Dial of Destiny were incredibly high, but... I did have some reservations going in, and there were three in particular that had me quite concerned. The first was Harrison Ford. Not to be mean, because he is and forever will be a Hollywood legend, but he's not exactly a spring chicken anymore. And I wasn't too sure how I would feel seeing a slightly rustier more delicate version of Indiana Jones. Thankfully though, this was an expectation that I was proven wrong on. Ford gives it his absolute all. You can tell how much this character means to him and how much he wants to deliver on this final send-off. Now I know that the digital de-aging has been a heated debate. I personally found the opening 20 minutes of this film to be my personal highlight. I thought that it harkened back to a classic Indiana Jones caper. And that's the digital de-aging included. I thought that the VFX, sure, they weren't seamless the entire time for the de-aging, but when they were good, they were great. Alas, they haven't quite worked out voice de-aging, because even though we're presented with an Indiana Jones and a Harrison Ford that looks about in his 30s, he still sounds like he's a gruff travel-worn 80-year-old. But nevertheless, Ford can still cut it and it is delightful to see him have this one final adventure. My second reservation was the absence of Steven Spielberg. This series is his love child and an example of a filmmaker operating at the height of his powers. So to see the reins handed over to James Mangold, who, for the record, is an outstanding filmmaker, Logan, Le Mans 66, but at the same time, he's not Spielberg. No one is. So my biggest concern is, will this still feel like an Indiana Jones movie? Thankfully, I was once again happy to be proven wrong. Mangold fits into this series as a director so damn easily. He knows how to craft intense and sprawling set pieces that this series is renowned for, and he also knows how to block action very well. Believe me, I could bore you senseless with a list of mainstream action filmmakers 
who are shocking at blocking fight scenes. And so my third and final reservation with this movie was one that I felt has flown under a lot of people's radars, maybe because their focus and worries have been on Ford and Mangold. But in actual fact, this is the first Indiana Jones movie where we don't have a story credit from George Lucas. You see, Lucas was integral into creating this series, knowing the characters inside and out, but also understanding the brief at hand. The Indiana Jones movies were always envisioned to be live-action adventure serials, hearkening back to what Spielberg and Lucas loved and grew up on in their childhood. But you know, with Lucas setting the pen down, we end up having uh, some screenwriters come in to take his place. I believe they are John Henry Butterworth, Jez Butterworth, David Coop, and James Mangold himself. So they stepped up to the plate, and for the first hour and 15 minutes, I was overjoyed. Everything seemed like it was clicking into place perfectly. The central MacGuffin of the movie, Archimedes' dial, the mystery involving that was engaging. The action was chock full of trademark Indiana Jones whimsy, and John Williams was reminding us why he is the GOAT, even at the age of 91. I was loving this movie. And then the second half happened. Yeah. When the credits rolled, I saw that there were four screenwriters attached. Not story supervisors, but credited screenwriters. And that's when everything began to make a bit more sense. The moment a fantastic tuk-tuk chase through the streets of Morocco concludes, that is the moment where I can pinpoint where the movie begins its downfall. To put it bluntly, it ran out of steam. Considering this clocked in at around two and a half hours, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny begins at a pretty rapid jog with occasional spurts of speed interspersed throughout. But as we reached that halfway mark, the film was overexhausted and practically running on empty. This left the second half of Dial of Destiny feeling fundamentally less compelling and, dare I say, laborious. In terms of new additions, Phoebe Waller-Bridge is delightful as the charming, if slightly overconfident, Helena. She bounces off of Indy very well, but all I will say is that there could have been more to her character besides her being a sarky Brit with some daddy issues. We also meet Teddy, who is essentially a short round ripoff and someone who I did not care for for the entire movie. Mads Mikkelsen is always a delight when he's strolling down the villainous side of life, and you don't tend to get more villainous than Nazis. Going back to my negatives, when I say the film dragged, I meant that it had next to no pace in that second half, and almost no sense of urgency, which in turn actually feels like heresy to describe that about Indiana Jones. The expedition frequently convolutes itself into an intelligible mess that struggles to maintain an overall sense of investment. As for the final act that has left audiences split down the middle, I didn't mind it. I thought it was definitely unique and had some cool parts about it. All I will say is that if you thought aliens were a step too far, you ain't seen nothing yet. I feel very conflicted about the Dial of Destiny. As an Indiana Jones fan, I was beaming at so many moments across the film. Trademark set pieces that were classic indie. The Raiders march blaring out triumphantly, and seeing Harrison Ford getting one last ride in. However, for all those good, there are also some bad. Pacing is the film's biggest offender, never being able to adjust to a longer runtime and slowing down far too much for my liking. The final act takes some big swings, and I think with the right build up, it could have worked. But because it's unceremoniously dropped on us, I was left wondering if there was ever any point. It's a crying shame I had every intention of leaving Dial of Destiny, celebrating it as one of my favourite films of the year, but I'm left rather indifferent to it. 
So I'm going to give Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, perhaps maybe generously, a 6.5 out of 10. So uh, let's do a brief ranking of the Indiana Jones series so you guys can get to know where I would rank all of those films now that I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that this franchise has concluded. Feel free to share your ranking of the Indiana Jones films in the comments below. So kicking off at number five, obviously following this review, it shouldn't come as much of a surprise, but yes, it is Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. I don't really need to give you my reasonings for that. I've just spent however long this review ends up being uh, explaining why, but yeah, it has its fair share of great moments, but it also has its fair share of quite lackluster moments. Then at number four, we have Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Do not get me wrong. This movie has some very, very silly stuff in it. The surviving a nuclear explosion by hiding in a fridge, aliens, Shia LaBeouf swinging on vines like a monkey. But that being said, when this film is really good, it's really, really good. I think the action scenes are criminally underrated. The overall adventure and the expedition they go on is interesting. Yes, it does end up with aliens and a UFO flying off, but it is fun. And ultimately, a sense of fun is what you want from an Indiana Jones movie. And then number three, we have Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Now, funny story, when I first watched this movie when I was a, a child, I really didn't like it. I don't know whether it was a mix of that I found it too scary or it didn't feel like Raiders of the Lost Ark all that much, but I went through like a stretch of my life really not liking Temple of Doom, but it was only in the past five years maybe that I rewatched it with obviously fresh eyes and I realized that younger me was an idiot, that this movie is so much fun, it's so entertaining, it moves at such a breakneck pace. Something is always happening even when we are in more quieter, calmer moments, there is something propelling this movie forward. I don't really get the hate for Short Round. I think Kihi Kwan is so immensely likable. I do, however, get the hate for Willy. She's very annoying. She is quite irritating. Uh, that being said, though, Temple of Doom probably has some of my favorite favorite set pieces in all of the Indiana Jones franchise. The minecart sequence for me ranks as honestly probably my top five favorite action sequences created by Steven Spielberg. I think it's phenomenal. So number two uh, we have Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. This film out of all of the Indiana Jones films probably has my favorite story in terms of Indy's quest for his dad and their subsequent quest to get the Holy Grail against the Nazis and Donovan. For me, it is so effortlessly entertaining. This movie, you watch it and you don't think, how were they able to pull this off? You just think, oh my god, they pulled it off. And the film is bolstered through the dynamite chemistry between Harrison Ford and Sean Connery. Their dynamic as father and son makes this movie. It is so, so damn good. But it's just not as good as my number one pick, which is, of course, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Raiders of the Lost Ark is might be a perfect movie. It really might. It is the quintessential adventure movie there really is nothing like it and i i don't think after all these years it was made back in 81 so we're looking at 40 42 years old now this film it still holds up it's brilliant in terms of staging it's brilliant in terms of bringing you along on their high stakes electric adventure we're introduced to one of the coolest characters that has ever, ever been on a cinema screen. Spielberg is just in another realm when he directed this. It is fan 
fantastic. I can watch it any time of the day, any day of the week, any week of the month. I can go on. It is phenomenal. Everything about it. Score. Sets. Action. I could go into so much depth about how much I love Raiders of the Lost Ark, but then this video would turn into about an hour and a half long. But safe to say, uh, it's well and truly earning my number one, my favourite Indiana Jones film of all time. So there we have it. Those are my thoughts on Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny and my rankings of the Indiana Jones franchise. Let me know. Have you seen Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny yet? What did you think? And what are your favourite Indiana Jones movies? My other question to you is who is your favourite Indiana Jones sidekick? I'm... Part of me would want to say Sean Connery as Indy's father, but I don't get... I never felt like he was his sidekick as such. I felt like they were equal in a way. So if we're going off of a sidekick, I'd have to pick Short Round. He's just... I, I love him. I really would not be opposed if there was a Short Round spin-off. But that is all we have time for today. So thank you very much for watching. And I will see you in the next video. Hello! Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have, make sure to click that like button. And if you aren't already, click that subscribe button too.